Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And today I'm so thrilled to be talking about the movie Love, Sarah with director Eliza Schroeder and Rupert Henry Jones, who plays Matthew in the film. And Eliza, I wanted to start by asking you about the genesis of the film, because you originally came up with the concept for this when you were studying film at Goldsmiths, and it kind of sat with you for a number of years. And so I was interested in, in kind of what the original spark of the idea was and the film that ended up existing, what really stuck from that initial idea and, and how it really evolved over those over those years? Such an interesting question. I think, you know, if you if you have some, certain characters in your mind for a while, then of course they change and they take ch shape and then other people shape them with you, which is the beauty of collaboration. Mm. And I guess what I always wanted to do is tell a story um, that would involve three very different, very headstrong women who mm -hmm. would somehow join forces and um, sort of overcome their initial um, sort of headstrong ideas of, of not finding ways back together to actually reconnect. Um, so that stuck definitely these three strong, headstrong women. Yeah. And then Rupert, I was interested in the journey that you took in really deconstructing this character from the scripts and really kind of understanding who he was at his core and, and your process and the way that you really like to work in terms of the preparation that you do with the scripts before you even arrive on set with the rest of the cast to then kind of pull those relationships together with them. Well, I mean, one of the things that drew me to the character was there was a sort of a misdirect with him. I mean, you kind of, you think he's something he's not when he first comes in. He's a bit cool. He's a bit sort of relaxed. And you feel like he's, well, why is this guy here? He's got this ulterior motive. Is there, is he trying to take over the business? Is he, is he trying to sort of, and then when he starts getting close to the, to the younger, younger of the three girls, is he sort of, you know, trying to make a play for her? I mean, what is, what is his agenda? And I like the fact that actually at the end of the day he's just a good guy coming in trying to do the right thing and it sort of flips it on his head I mean it's you think he's you think he's a bad guy at the beginning and he ends up being this sort of rather nice lovely honest person and um that 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 is what I sort of latched onto and went for from the beginning really I tried to sort of make him be slightly off at the beginning and not and almost too too good to be true so that when when you when you got towards the end of the film, you were pleasantly surprised that he wasn't the the, the nasty piece of work you maybe thought he could have been at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and then Eliza, I was really interested in the unique challenge of, of building a film around the idea of a character who we don't experience on screen. It's it's not a spoiler within the, the opening credits, we see that Sarah passes away. Um, and the film's really about these other characters and the impact that that has on their lives. But she still feels very much present throughout the film in the way that you've written her into these other characters. So what was the unique aspects that for you and, and the challenges of, of trying to make sure that we still got such a sense of who she was, what her interpersonal relationships were, and, and why she's having this particular impact on these characters in their journeys. I was actually hoping, we, we were discussing this quite a lot, and we actually shot the, the accident, so we, we, we filmed it. And then we, I, I decided not to show it because I wanted to, I, I rather wanted the audiences to see her through the characters than um, then sort of showing her directly in your face. And I want people to have, you know, their own imagination um, about for a while about who she was, what she meant to them and, um, you know, what kind of influence she had. And I thought it was much more powerful to actually not show that with a face, mm -hmm. which of course then later on you see, but, you know, in the beginning you, you're sort of, you, you're developing your own sort of um, image in your mind what, what this person was for these three. And she has a very strong, distinct meaning for all the three of them. And then how, for, how did that impact your choices in your performance, Rupert, in terms of thinking about this character that has, a, you know, such a history with Matthew and they clearly spent a lot of time together, even though they haven't seen each other in recent years, they've, they've become more estranged and, and how that really impacted the way that you thought about his processing of, of grief and loss in, in the very specific way because of the relationship dynamic between the two of them. I don't know. I mean, I never really felt that he had suffered that much grief. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, she was somebody he'd known and that he'd had a relationship with, but it had been a relationship that, it, as you, I mean, I don't know quite how much I'm spoiling or allowed to spoil while I'm speaking to you, but but he um, he wasn't, she wasn't the one for him, and he kind of knew mm -hmm. that she wasn't the one for him. So I think, I think um, the, the grief side of things was more about maybe the love that was lost rather than mm -hmm. the loss of her. I think and I think again that's what has sat with him he's been trying to find somebody to fill the hole but not necessarily the hole that was left by Sarah. Mm 
yeah so i think that that was sort of his 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 deal really what he was trying to deal with mm -hmm. and eliza i thought the way that you dealt with with this theme of grief it was so interesting in the way that each of these characters has their own individual journey and relationship with it. And you also kind of go for the more subtle version of the exploration of it. You know, you you didn't feel a need to throw in a scene where someone's wailing and going, you know, why did this happen? It's like they, they all have already reached the point of acceptance and it's about being proactive and what they're going to do as an action point off the back of this. Um, and so I was interested in kind of like overall why that was the specific tone that you wanted to take with this exploration of grief in the film. Um, um, and then how you really thought about it individually for each of the characters, because they all have such unique experiences with it. Um, I think uh, I, I really wanted to make sure that people, you know, feel the depth of the loss. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. what it means to, to lose a dear one. I've, I've lost my mum a few years back mm -hmm. and it's really shaped me as a personality and who I am today and, and how I think. And of course, the grieving is, is, is terrible and horrible. It never really quite goes away, but I guess you learn to deal with it. And I, I was interested in that part of the, of the process. And I was interested to see what actually happens if you overcome your sort of, to a certain extent, even self-pity, which you see with all of the three of them in a, li a little bit, they're all very self-centered because that's who you are when you're grieving. I have five siblings and we were all very much, we were very close, but we were all grieving in our own way. It was always a little bit selfish really. So I guess, I wanted to show what, what happens if you actually then join forces and um, overcome the grief together. And of course it will never go, but it will also suddenly you see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And you, mm -hmm. I guess I wanted to inspire people to give love and life another chance despite what has happened to them. Yeah. And then I feel like obviously it would be remiss not to talk about the food within the film. And, and I was really interested in how you worked with pastry chefs and, and consultants to really think about the filming of it, because, you know, we always see those pictures and, and hear stories about food commercials and, you know, see whipped cream being used for ice cream. And, and so I was interested in even just like what were some of the specific logistics that that required as well? I was. I have to laugh so much because I was always texting Rupert previously <laughs> to the shoot, saying, do you, "Are you sure? Can you? I, can you do it?" And he was like, "Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry. I can." And I was a bit like, "Uh, okay. Can, does he really know? Is he gonna? Is he gonna be believable?" And because we didn't have as much, you know, of course we had time together beforehand, but not as much as we would on, have on a big budget. And 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 he really pulled it off. My God. I mean, I don't know what he's how he who taught him that at home. <laughs> I have no idea, or is he, is he just a natural? But he did it <laughs> super well. And um, we had a food stylist, but we, we you know, and she, she really, she was incredible. She uh, and sort of was advising us as to what to take, you know, in terms of making sure that we have international bakes. But even the producer and I were, were driving through London, looking at all the different um, bakes from around the world, really, to, to really be real to mm -hmm. the theme of having bakes from around the world. And, um, and it was incredible how, you know, our food stylist and advisor, she was just whipping things up like quickly. And then we, you know, got things, got one cake and we only had two versions of it, but it broke. And it was, you know, the first working with food is always quite challenging. <laughs> and I remember we had this one um, amazing uh, macaron at this, that we see in the film. And, <laughs> and we had, we, we somehow, they had different colors and it was, they looked completely different. And we we're like, how can that be? Because we've ordered the same thing. So, you know, we've had a few great glitches, but, in terms of performance from from the actors, I think Shetty and um, and Rupert really did an amazing job to mm -hmm. you know to persuade us that they are stars in the kitchen. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I really love the theme that you take within the film where this bakery, they, you know, like you, you touched upon just there that they start making all these international bakes and that becomes the core of their business. And so I was interested in, in the journey of research and, and looking into all of those different international pastries and, and what those would be and what they would mean to people. And then from there, how you really selected what were, what were the recipes and, and baked goods that you felt would really support the narrative arc? Because, you know, there's, there's ones that really become part of the story as well. Um, yeah, I mean, that, there it was really helpful to talk to the food stylist, and of course, it was always a balance between the bakes looking uh, looking sort of nice uh, on, on the screen and at the same time having a meaning. And I think probably for me, the most interesting cake is the matcha meal crepe cake because it really, I mean, b before I did this film, and I, I've always loved bakes and everything that's sweet, but I've never really gone into the different cultures that much. And mm -hmm. I think that this matcha meal crepe cake really represents Japanese and how they are very delicate and very fine and very precise. And this is what this is. And it was really, it was such an interesting learning curve as well to learn, you know, learn about different cultures and their habits through their bakes. Yeah. 
And then Rupert, obviously, Eliza was touching on, you know, how intricately you managed to, to master this art through your character. And I was interested in, in what you did to really understand not just his work as a pastry chef, but also just even looking at the scenes when you're in the kitchen and how intimately he moves with the items and, and you really kind of capture that essence as, as if it's something that he's been doing for years through your performance. Oh, really? That's wonderful. That's, that's yeah. great. Because to be honest, as, as Eliza said, there wasn't a lot of time and we, we didn't get, a, I did, wasn't able to go into a kitchen and work with a pastry chef for weeks and sort of work out mm -hmm. all. so I sort of treated it more as I used to do a lot of art at school and mm. um, A-level art and all that kind of stuff and so I just treated the cakes like they were paintings or pottery or something like that I mean I do a lot of cooking I'm not necessarily a big baker but I've, I've done a lot of cooking and um, uh, I found that the, the, the detail was the thing that sold it so being very careful about just being very precise about how you put a chocolate ball on a cake or how you sprinkle sugar on a cake was sort of was sort of the way I the way I went about it really and uh, I just also I, it was about how Shelley and I moved around each other in the kitchen too and how sharing an intimate space like that creating something together it creates an intimacy between the two of you and we were very close together mm -hmm. at times and when we were apart we were able to look at each other and watch each other making the cakes and there were lots of stuff that we could do that was nothing to do with the dialogue or that wasn't written in the scenes that we were able to just sort of work and dance around that sort of kitchen environment with these with these fabulous cakes. Yeah, there's also something really interesting about the, the personality and what that tells you about who he is as a person through that profession, you know, the amount of patience and care and delicacy that he has to have every single day in, in what he does. So how did that feed into your understanding of who he was as a character through this work that he does? Um, I did. I didn't really go down that road. Really, I kept that. In some ways, I kind of the two things were separate. He was. He was. He was a fabulous. He's a fabulous baker, but at the same time, he had this this dilemma of this: was this what, who was he in, in relation to these women? And he was desperately trying to work it out and keep it a secret. So he was. He was playing these two very. He was living two separate lives, pretending to be something he wasn't, but then also being this being this baker so he was there for reasons that he couldn't let them know about and so so the the, the whole the things weren't gelling together I was enjoying keeping these two set these two things separate his per his personal life and his relationship with these women and then his his ambition and his desire to be this great chef so there were two very separate things really Mm -hmm. And and to that point, with the relationships with with the women and the fact that you have you know three generations, you've got Sarah's mother and Sarah's daughter in the film. Um, I was interested, Eliza, in, in how you really thought about what would be their family traits and the similarities that would connect these characters with each other. I think all of them will be very stubborn and very sort of headstrong and and, <laughs> and, and, and strong personalities. Um, so I guess like, like they, they, they were all, they were like that really, weren't they? they I mean, were. <laughs> typecast. <laughs> they were, it was, a, it was a set full of headstrong women, but in a good way, you know, it's a, yeah. had their, you know, I have to say it was, a, it was an incredible team spirit that we had and, you know, a lot of trust for, from all of them um, for, to, to a first time director who, you know, you don't know. So that was really, I, I appreciated that very much. So. Yeah, they were headstrong as personalities and as characters, and and I think that was for me really how how do headstrong um, uh, sort of stubborn women find the way to to escape their shell and maybe explore something new and that will bring them something that they haven't expected. Yeah, I also really appreciate the fact that with the character of Matthew, that you know through your performance and and through the way that you've introduced him and directed him, that he's a character who comes in and doesn't try to assert himself over these women. He knows that this is their space and he's kind of a guest walking into it and has to kind of figure out how they want things to be. Um, and so I was interested in, in how the two of you really thought about the way that he comes into that space and the fact that, you know, it is their bakery and, and he's kind of the one coming into the middle of the mix. Well, I mean, again, for me, there was sort of life imitating art i was very much in that environment at work you know i had a female director female producer three three very very strong female actors that i was working with and so the way i was conducting myself on set was probably quite similar to the way that matthew was conducting himself in the bakery i think and um if things got too hot in the kitchen i would i would step out off and off off the set and have a little wait a little wait around the corner and then come back <laughs> um and i think um i think the uh 
th that dynamic was was very realistic and that's how i think a lot of men would be i think if it had been a different environment if there'd been maybe the one woman with the with the with the bakery and he'd asking matthew to come in and help her out i think there maybe would have been much more of a power mm -hmm. uh, maybe a power struggle going on but he was completely outnumbered and i don't and i think he would have been an idiot to try and sort of assert himself in a in a sort of macho way in that in that environment i think he would have been crazy and as as i would have been on set <laughs> he also wasn't that kind of character. He that was not the reason why he was there. He was, he was absolutely there, not. No. That Rupert was describing, which were much more sort of exploring, you know, potential the potential father being the potential father of Clarissa, but also really finding um, Isabella. So I think you know, the, of course, that the coming in as a chef was always a bit of an excuse. So there was much more. There was much of much subtlety going on, and um, he's quite a gentle character, I think. Yes. Yes. And then Eliza, because um, he was just touching upon female, the female producer that you had, I wanted to talk a little bit about Rajita Shah, who was your producer on this film. And, and it just, it sounds like she was incredibly instrumental from very early on in the journey of this film in terms of even helping you find the right screenwriter who was going to really capture your vision and also helping you find what the tone of the movie was going to be. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit about some of, some of the things that she really helped to shepherd with the film and, and some of the decisions that she helped you to make creatively. I mean, I'm extremely lucky to have met her because, you know, I remember when, she, when I was telling her, let's shoot a Notting Hill on location. And she was like, are you nuts? How do you want to, like, how, how is that going to work? And I was like, no, you have to make it work, really. And then she took me on a tour around London. I mean, I, I do know London because I've lived here for, I don't know, like 15 years. So, you know, but she insisted on taking me on, on the tour around London to find a different spot. And I said, no, this is a Notting Hill story. I want to shoot on location, Notting Hill, you have to make it happen. And she did. And she did, she went, she, she really did way and beyond to, to you know, in, in, in an amazing sort of spirit, always in a good mood, always positive, always up for it to, to uh, because we, again, we had, you know, there was a limited budget, budget scale that we had. So, and within that, I wanted a lot and she really made it happen. And so she's a, she's a, she's a fantastic producer. Yeah. And tone wise, I know that when you first came up with the concept for the film that you were thinking of it as a little bit more of like a darker drama than necessarily kind of having some of the comedic elements and that she was really pivotal to helping you figure out that that was an element that you should have in the film and, and was just interested in about those conversations with the two of you and, and how that really came to light in the film. The three of us, so the writer Jake, Rashida, and I always had these uh, hilarious meetings where script meetings where we would, where I would always try to bring it down. And then I always wanted to have it darker and, you know, it needed to be rich in terms of emotions and, you know, needed to matter. And, and then we had this, I had this hilarious conversation with the both of them. They said, well, people have to laugh and you gotta, you gotta bring it up. You got, you can still have your dad. And we had, we had constantly, whichever scene we were talking about, we constantly had, not, 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 not in a negative way, but in a, in a constructive way, the battle of is this a comedy or is this a drama? Can we make it, can we lift it up a little bit? Can we just bring it down a touch? So it was always that, but I think that was really great because I guess I'm probably a little bit more torn towards darker material just because I wanted, but the, mo the most important thing for me was that people, people really, before, before they have their laughter, I wanted them to earn the laughter and I wanted them to cry. And I knew I only had so much time to make that happen. I wanted them to really feel the depth of the emotion that comes about when you're losing someone. And I knew I was always battling with the time. So I said, you know, even in the edit, I said, look, I need this, you know, this, the beginning needs to be deep and strong and, you know, people need to feel the loss and, and then they can laugh. And I, if we manage, I don't know, but I've tried my best. <laughs> <laughs> and Rupert, did, did, did the tone of the film and kind of like knowing that that was Eliza's specific voice that she wanted to have and the way that she wanted to mix these different tones, did that impact the way that you were thinking about your performance at all and any of the choices that you made? Um, I wasn't that aware, actually, of the, the battle that was going on with Eliza between how dark and light it should be. Um, I mean, I'm somebody who <clears throat> sits more on the darker side of things. I think as a, as a performance, it's easier to go to the darker to the darker places than, the, than I think the comedy side of things is much harder and finding that timing and that softness of touch is, is, is harder. But that's, that's actually something, one of the reasons I, I, I always saw the film as a, as, a, as a light romantic comedy that doesn't go down the obvious routes that surprises you right from the beginning to, to, the, to the end. The things you think you, think you know where the film's gonna go and it, and it, doesn't, it doesn't go there a lot of the time. And I, and I, I love that about it. And so I, I, and I've that, that, that constantly keeping you off, off kilter slightly was, 
was a was a joy for me and uh, and it was like that with my as i said earlier with the with the character and i think i think the fact that you don't know you you think you know it's going to go one way and it goes another way is is is, is one of the cleverest things about the film and i i know i love that about it and you were both touching a little bit before about how <coughs> you didn't have very much time before you were filming but you did have a little bit of time all together so so what did you really find was the most useful use of that time that you had whether it was just having specific conversations kind of like researching certain things together or whether there was kind of like scene rehearsal and really just kind of figuring out the exact beats of some of the specific scenes in the film i think for me it was it was the sort of the the relationships we were all having at work, you know, the day when you arrive, when you get on set and you sit and we chat, there was a lot of joking around a lot. We got to know each other very quickly. And I think one of the most important things when you're trying to shoot something quickly and you don't have a lot of time and a lot of money is for everybody, everybody to be on the same page. And, uh, and you do that by all talking and sitting and just just chatting around around the subject and while you're there at work. And uh, we all knew the film we were making, I think, quite quite uh, quite early on once we'd started and uh, and that came from just everybody getting on we all, we were all we were all very friendly nobody was going off and hiding in their own space or their own trailer we didn't have anywhere to go <laughs> we were all stuck we were all stuck in the same place all day but that actually ended up being a massive positive i think it really helped it was because a lot of the time when you're on these films with bigger budgets everyone just disappears off as soon as they're they're not needed they go back to their their horse box or whatever whatever their hotel room or whatever it is they're in was this we were it was freezing cold outside and we were in this little cafe and we had one little cafe next door and we just sat there all day just talking and shooting the shit and that was kind of how how and i think that really helped us find find the film actually yeah and i remember we had one scene that we on on the market outside on portobello and we had restrictions in terms of what how we can shoot and you know I had big ideas and then I knew I had to you know also in terms of timing and stuff I needed to combine certain scenes and I will never forget the brainstorm that we had all of us together Rupert, uh, Shannon, Shelley and even I think even Celia was there although she wasn't in the scene <laughs> and, we, <laughs> and we were just you know we were just it was an amazing brainstorm it was it was not something it, it, it wasn't something that would have happened in, in, in prep. This was just, you know, just let's let's be creative together now. And that was really, I, I love that. As much as I need and want preparation, I also think sometimes the magic comes from these moments where you're just sitting together in a, in a like, like Rupert described. And it really, for me, it was really like, a, it sounds stupid, but it was really like a family atmosphere. It was a really strong bond between us. And um, so therefore there was trust and it was really quite a quite a nice creative experience, I think. And then Eliza, I also wanted to ask a little bit about the way in which you worked with the cast and kind of communicated with them and, and worked on finding those rhythms and finding the tone and scenes for their performances, because a huge part of your job as the director is to kind of look at how each individual actor is interpreting their character, but also stylistically how they like to work and, and to give them the tools that they need. So what was that journey like in times in terms of just like figuring out what they needed from you and, and figuring out a lot of the scenes together? Very interesting because I'm just <laughs> reading this book or uh, having this audiobook directing actors and it's very good and it's um so of course I'm trying to improve my skills as the next project <laughs> come in and I and I, there's moments where I'm thinking have I done this did I do this did I be able to really I don't know um no but I you know what I went a lot with my instinct and I think I also I'm a good listener and I think I am um, I can probably um understand people's psychology um, not quickly, but I pay attention to it, and I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm a good, I'm a good observer, and I guess I'm also a team spirit person, and so you know, I will let people in. Ultimately, I will go my way with their inputs, but I, you know, I will then still do it, do most of it, sort of the way I think it should be done. But I, yeah, I think I have a team spirit. I think I've, I've gained their trust by simply connecting with them and trying to, you know, of course, again, if you have more prep time, that's the one thing I would think that next time I would love to have more prep time because I would have understood certain characters. And we were, hot. it was sometimes hot. It was sometimes challenging because, you know, everyone had their opinion and I let them in. So then you also sometimes get opposition and then you have to deal with that. So it's not always easy. And by letting everyone in, you also, you, you allow everyone to raise their, 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 their voice. So there's a fine line between everything, I guess, if I would have had a bit more prep time, I would have probably gotten under people's skin a bit more, under my actor's skin a bit more. So sometimes I would have been able to guide them better. But I, I think, I don't know, Rupert has 
say how he felt, but I, I think, you know, we, we had a relationship of trust between us. Well, yeah, you know, to that point for you, Rupert, what did you feel were the best pieces of communication that Eliza gave you or the tools that she really gave you to find your performance in this film? Um, well, I mean, it's difficult to put my finger on anything specific, but as she said, there was this feeling of trust and um, also of mutual respect between everybody. And we did have the fabulous Celia, who brought an energy into all the scenes that was that we all fed off really. So whenever she was there, if everybody, a lot of the time, one of the problems I felt was the fact that our energy was low in scenes, but it, it, as soon as Celia came in, <clears throat> she just brought everything up and you just, you spent your time just trying to sort of keep up with her and match with her. And I felt that her her influence in the film was was massive, not just in terms of her performance, but in terms of the energy she brought to the scenes and to the cast and to the whole way we worked, and I think, um, and I think that's one of the, as as Liza was said, it's one of the one of the one of the one of the, the tricks to the trade is listening to other people and learning from other people and what and and taking that on board. If you think you know it all, then you are probably not going to be as good as you could be. And uh, <clears throat> Liza was brilliant like that and letting everybody. I mean, she did let everybody have have their say and their opinion. And I, you know, and that's a hard thing to do when you're on a film with very little time, because one thing that takes up time is everyone discussing how a scene should be on set. And, you know, a lot of the time you want that to have happened in the rehearsal period before you start filming. So even though she didn't have that, she was still giving us a chance to, to put our point forward. But um, at the end of the day, we, we had to listen to Eliza and most of the time she was right. Weren't you Eliza? <laughs> And for both of you in the journey of making this film, what, what's the biggest thing that you feel that you had the opportunity to really learn about your craft or, or take away from the experience? Well, I, I just, I, it was one of those, for me, it was just a, one of those films where I, I learned how to get on with people well and, and step back when I should do and, and hopefully step back when I should do. And um, uh, just, it was, it was, it was, it was just one of those experiences where you had to just get on with everybody because there wasn't time not to, and you had to kind of make it make it work. I mean, for me, the scenes I had to do in terms of uh, in terms of coming to an actor wasn't wasn't a massive stretch. It was just getting the tone the tone right and finding what the tone of the film was. I mean, I wasn't having to do anything really that was that was scary that I was nervous about there was no massive emotional scene where I had to break down there was no huge anger scene you know it was it was very fine fine lines that, that he was walking a very sort of fine line between between things so, but it never went to extremes so there was nothing ever that I was it was just finding that tone and um I learned, I think I learned a bit how to do that. And I learned how to bring a bit of energy to this. I mean, Celia did teach me a lot. That 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 yeah. working with her was 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 wonderful. Yeah, it really was. I think so too. And for me, I mean, I've learned so many things because of course it's my first, you know, feature. So I've I've learned something every day, several times. I've learned a lot about psychology and how to deal with people. I've learned a lot about, you know, the, the, the communicate the visual communication that is so important because I knew visually I knew exactly what I wanted and I had an amazing um, sort of supporter and 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 executor in in, in Aaron Reed the, the DOP who was just making I think producing magical pictures so I've, I've I've been extremely lucky I've learned a lot from all these amazing people around me who have much more experience than me and um, let me in and gave me a chance. Well I want to thank you both so much for taking time to talk about the movie and, and congratulations on everything that you've achieved with it thank you to both of you. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you. <laughs>